welcome to Eye on Africa, France 24's program focused on the continent. I'm Charlie James and these are the headlines. A shock development in Cameroon's presidential poll, opposition candidate Maurice Kempto claims victory. Despite no official results, the government says his claim is illegal. Atiku Abubakar will represent Nigeria's main opposition party in next year's presidential election, challenging incumbent Mohamedou Buhari. Now a last-minute candidate could also change the game. And as the Me Too movement marks one year, we take a look at how some women in Africa continue to face cultural challenges to standing up against sexual harassment. Now, no official results have been announced after Sunday's presidential election in Cameroon, but opposition candidate Maurice Kamto has already declared victory. It's a surprise, as 85-year-old incumbent Paul Bia has been widely expected to win a seventh term and continue his 36-year hold on power. But the lack of a vote count didn't stop Kamto from calling on Bia to step down, an action the government has called illegal. I call on the outgoing President of the Republic to organize the conditions for a peaceful transfer of power in order to protect Cameroon from a post-electoral crisis which our country does not need. Only the Constitutional Council shall adopt and proclaim the results of an election. So all the candidates must abide by the rules of the game. We cannot do otherwise. So any attempt to disrupt public order, I can tell you that will be handled thoroughly. So we don't have any time for destruction. So this your candidate, I don't want to call his name, but he knows that he has no means to defy state authority. No one will give him the possibility to do that. The message should be very, very clear. And no act of vandalism shall be tolerated, no matter the person. Now, earlier on the program, we were joined by Indira Ayuk, who is covering this story for France 24. She explained what Camto is basing his victory claim on. Maurice Camto is basing his allegations on preliminary votes or preliminary results which were counted in uh, polling stations, about 25,000 polling stations across the uh, country. Now, representatives of the different political parties uh, participated in the vote count in the different polling stations alongside uh, ELECAM officials and also observers or election observers. So he is uh, uh, counting on these, uh, the preliminary results to declare his can or to declare his victory in Sunday's presidential elections. Also, one of the opposition uh, opposition figures, one of the youngest, Cabra Libi, set up an app which uh, helped in counting those votes. I think that is what he's counting on to uh, stand or to make his stance uh, clear that he has or he emerged uh, victorious in uh, Sunday's uh, poll. Now, his announcement came as a total surprise to so many people. There have been uh, reactions on social media, so many people talking about it while some are jubilating and expressing their satisfaction with his declaration. Others are a little bit skeptical as uh, President Bia manages, or President Bia who has been in power for the past uh, 36 years, has lots of supporters all through the country. Now, the government of Bia has already called Kemto an outlaw for saying that he is the victor. Is there a chance that he could face repercussions for this? Uh, Maurice Camto is a law professor. He is a seasoned lawyer and he masters the judicial system in Cameroon very well. The Minister of uh, Communication or Information has called him an outlaw and for acting illegally. I guess he, he knows what he's counting on and he knows how to proceed. But however, knowing Cameroon and the fact that going against the law is a serious offense, he may be, uh, uh, he may be, uh, the government may go after him and try to call him to order. The Minister of Territorial Administration also warned that any acts of vandalism will not be tolerated by the government. Turning now to Nigeria, where at midnight Sunday, the deadline passed to declare candidacy for the upcoming presidential elections. The race had been shaping up to be between two veteran male leaders, opposition candidate Atiku Abubakar and incumbent Mohamedou Bahari. But now a prominent female politician could shake that up. 
Nicholas Chamon takes a look at the top candidates. It's a first step towards the presidency. Atiku Abubakar, who's from the northeastern state of Adamawa, won the primary race of Nigeria's main opposition party, the PDP. He obtained more than 40% of the delegates' votes. I hereby accept your nomination to be the candidate of our great party, the People's Democratic Party. Last month, a 71-year-old who was Nigeria's vice president between 1999 and 2007 explained why he's a candidate for the fourth time. I felt there was need, you know, for somebody like me to step out, uh, experience in politics, experience in governance, experience in business, to try and restore and bring back the country on track. Abu Bakr used to be the head of the customs service during two decades of military rule. At the time, and when he was vice president, he was accused of corruption. Abu Bakr, a business tycoon, hopes to follow in the footsteps of President Buhari, who was elected in 2015 at his fourth attempt. Buhari was confirmed as his party's candidate this weekend. Both men will face a popular woman who's just announced she will be running. Obiageli Izikwesili is a former minister who co-founded the Bring Back Our Girls movement. Of the 270 girls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram jihadists in 2014, about 100 are still missing. Izik Wasili will not have a major political party backing her, but she will appeal to many women and southerners. She's from the south, whereas the other two frontrunners are from northern Nigeria. A tragic fire in the Democratic Republic of Congo has now killed at least 53 people. A tanker truck collided with a vehicle in the western village of Mbuba on Saturday. After residents rushed to collect leaking fuel, a fire broke out, then quickly spread to nearby homes. The health ministry says more than 72 people are also hospitalized, and that given the severity of the burns, the death toll will likely rise. The Me Too movement turned one year old last week and continues to have a global impact. But for women in some African countries, speaking up against sexual harassment remains a challenge. This report looks at the effects of the movement on cultures where women are expected to stay silent. At this university in Kampala, two professors have been suspended from their duties following accusations from students of sexual harassment. It's thanks to the hashtag MeToo movement that the victims found the courage to speak out. But this bucks the trend in Uganda, where denunciation of sexual harassment is rare. As much as we see women coming out, then we see a lot of backlash. We see a lot of people, when you ask some Ugandans uh, out there, they'll say, oh, but we're tired of this whole women empowerment uh, uh, talking. Traditional views on the role of women in Uganda's patriarchal society means even complaining about domestic violence is an uphill battle. Here's what one politician had to say on the matter on national television in March. As a man, you need to discipline your wife. You need to, you know, touch her a bit and you tuck her hand, you beat her somehow, you know, to really streamline her, to, 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 to enable her really, get on the line. Yeah, you, you, you need to, to do some little bit of beating. It shows love even. He later apologized after being criticized for his remarks, but his views are not uncommon in the region. This Kenyan psychologist, who prefers to remain anonymous, is the victim of domestic abuse. She says every woman that she's told of her experience has been through something similar, but she found it challenging to file a complaint. Judgment comes this way, but you know what, one day you're a smart mouth, you're too intellectual, so you know, maybe you push the guy too hard, you ask you know, maybe the wrong questions, so again, I have to start justifying myself. I'm not going to take myself through that. According to a global report from Plan International on the safety of young women and girls, Africa is considered a danger zone for women. It states that four of the top five most risky cities in the world for sexual assault are on the continent. Johannesburg, Kampala, Nairobi and Bamako. And finally, cultures collided at this year's African Fashion International show in Johannesburg. The catwalk was a fusion of fashion this weekend as designers displayed their spring-summer collections under the theme Afro-Asia. To fit with this year's theme, designers from Asian countries, including China, Cambodia, and Japan, also showed. 
Let's hear from a couple of designers speaking about what inspired their collections. We've borrowed from the Scottish, we've borrowed from the Swat, we've borrowed from the Zulu, but in an abstract way, um, um, by not making it obvious. Of course, we still work with our Matosa signature prints, but um, I'm, I'm shy by all means to celebrate other cultures outside of the Tosa people. We're proud, of being, we're proud to be Tosa, but don't look down on other cultures as well. So that was the statement that I was trying to project to the public. I mean, I took inspiration from Nigeria. Nigerians are so brass about their proud Africanness, about the way they're just so unapologetic. And I'm just like, this is the Africa we need to be living in. It's just be unapologetically African so that if I'm in New York, if I'm in London, if I'm anywhere, they need to know that I'm from Africa. That's all for this edition of Eye on Africa, but don't go away. There's more news coming up next here on France 24.